Hi, I'm George, your WeatherWise tour guide. I'm going to get you started on how to use WeatherWise for the first time here and talk a little bit more about where to find a few things and also how to read the radar a little bit. We're going to have more in-depth videos in the future on this, but this is going to be a general how to get started. So let's get to it. Now let's head to the WeatherWise app for the first time on our browser on the PC. Now you can type this into your mobile browser as well, or of course, download the apps. But of course, let's go ahead and type this in web.weatherwise.app. And that will bring up the WeatherWise radar for us. So I've opened up WeatherWise for the first time here. Now I don't have the new welcome message, but you should have that. And I would obviously hit locate me. That's gonna automatically locate the nearest radar tower to you and pull you up on the map a lot faster, as well as giving you some quick tutorials on how to view different things and what different things may mean. But WeatherWise is an incredibly useful software because it's not only a bit more on the professional side, but it is very, very, very friendly to new users. That said, I can understand that it can be a bit overwhelming to open for the first time, just as any new thing is. But let's go ahead and take some of that stress off of you and help you on identifying what it is that you need to do to get started on the WeatherWise radar. But again, it offers a high resolution look, so it's a lot better than a lot of those radars that you see on your phone. So for example, for today, we're going to live in Oklahoma, folks. Let's go ahead and scroll and zoom on in. And we're going to activate the nearest radar to, let's say we live in Tulsa. Let's go ahead and activate the KINX radar there. That radar has lit up green. We now know that that radar is active. And around it, we see some reflectivity of some precipitation occurring. So again, we know this is rainfall that's occurring around the Tulsa area because we've now activated the radar. And down here in the bottom left, we see that we are on reflectivity. I do want to point out, though, that you don't want to go too far away from the point that you're wanting to look at. What I mean by that is if I live in Tulsa, I really don't want to go to the radar that's up here toward Dodge City in Kansas because it's going to be further away. We're not going to be able to see the full scope of the event. We want to make sure that we're at the radar that's closest to our location, which again is the KINX. In very rare scenarios, we may want to go a little bit further away and then look back into the storm. In that case, we would use something like what's down here in Fort Smith, the KSRX where we can still see the storm, it's still within range. It's not the most optimal radar, but it gives us a different angle into the storm. The radar works in angles, it works in beams. So we wanna make sure that we're looking at it in different angles to make sure that we're getting the same idea no matter how we're looking at it. So with that said, let's go ahead and click back up here to our more optimal radar, zoom in a little bit. But let's say I wanted to see the history of this storm. Well, I actually go down here and just hit the play button. So if I go down here and hit the play button, I can actually pause it. Hit the scroll bar here, drag it back, drag it forward, look at all the way up until the last hour or so. We'll be, we'll be able to see how this storm moved and what it produced in its wake. If I wanted more scans and going even further back, all the way up to three to four hours, I can actually subscribe to Plus and get all those scans that are available. If you look right next to the scans, we'll actually see the storm tracks. So the storm tracks are really cool too. Each line indicates about 15 minutes so we know that this storm is going to be a little bit to the east of Salem Springs and actually going along the Highway 412 here in about 45 minutes. So let's go ahead and turn those storm tracks off. And down here as well in this drop box, you're actually going to be able to see that you can change the metrics. So for example, in velocity, if I didn't want miles per hour, maybe I want meters per second or knots or feet per second, I can change that there. If I wanted to turn off the secondary towers, which by the way are the ones in yellow, which we do see one near Tulsa there, most folks don't use these. They hardly ever come into play, and most people will turn them off if they want, just like that. The range ring that you see here is actually the range of the radar. So if I zoom back out, we see this thin black line here. That's the range of the current radar that I am on. So if I follow this all the way down to Fort Worth, all the way out toward Pampa, all the way out toward middle Kansas, you can actually see that this is the technical range of this radar. Now, obviously, we probably won't use this same radar that we're using, for example, all the way up there toward Topeka, Kansas, right? We'll use the KTWX. It's more centralized. That is how the range ring works. We'll go ahead and turn that back off now. Let's go ahead and zoom back in here. I want to show you something else that's pretty cool. 
So right now we have this radar a little bit more focused for the video, but let's say we wanted to, to be on the default. We'll actually go back down here to the reflectivity gate filter where I've changed it before. Default, this would be looking all the way down here toward negative 30, and we'll see all this occurring. If you wanna clean this up on your radar, what we'll actually do is come back down here once again. And again, I have mine set to about an eight, because again, that cleans it up without cleaning up too much that we're messing up the image of what to expect. Big recommendation here, do not go over 10. Once you do that, you start getting, again, just not the correct vision of what's occurring. As you can see here, I'm basically erasing everything. Uh, so eight is a really good balance, for example, for, for what I use on uh, balancing between cleaning it up, but not cleaning it up to the point where we're losing what is actually occurring. Now that we have some of the radar drawer identified, I wanna kind of break down what's happening here a little bit. Now there's no severe weather going on, so we can't identify any rotation or anything really important that's occurring here. But I just wanna go over real quickly what WeatherWise has available for you to look at when breaking down a storm. But as for now, I wanna show you that this is how the velocity works, for example. So velocity looks like this. Velocity is basically the measure and direction of your wind speed. So red is heading out away from the radar called outbound. Green is heading into the radar called inbound. And so that's how we determine the wind direction as well as any rotation that may be occurring. And you can use the inspector tool down here, clicking on that little target looking thing, and we can measure the wind gusts that are occurring. So again, a really cool and useful tool to be able to identify the wind gusts that may be occurring and where they're going in the middle of storm activity. Correlation coefficient is another really cool one. It's the way to measure and identify objects or debris that may be occurring in the air. This is something you see referred to often during tornadic activity because we use this tool to identify any objects that may be thrown up into the atmosphere, called a debris ball or anything else you may have heard. We also use this to identify potential hell cores that are occurring. Again, no great examples today, but that's how that tool works. Lastly, another big one in the severe weather department is the enhanced echo tops. But this is really good to identify potential pockets of taller storms that may be producing a little bit more tough weather. Oh, one quick note before we do move on. Vertical integrated liquid is a cool tool to use for measuring any heavier rain cores that may be occurring or any hell cores that might be popping up. Again, no great examples. This that we're seeing on the radar right now is an example of some very heavy rainfall that's occurring out there toward Fayetteville, as well as back over towards Salam Springs and so on and so forth. When they get really tight, vibrant, and bright, that's usually indicative of more of a hell core occurring but again, no great examples of that right now. Okay, resetting here. We've covered a, a few of those products throughout the radar drawer. Again, we'll have more videos on that in the future, covering more in depth on how those are very useful during severe weather. What I wanna show you now is how different radars may be online or offline. But again, if we look down here in the radar drawer, we'll actually see that this says live and it has a black text. We know that that radar is up and working. For example, we know that the one in Eastern Kentucky is down right now. We'll see that it does not say live. It is in red. And we know that that radar is inaccurate right now. So what we would do if we live somewhere out in Eastern Kentucky is to find a different radar that might be a little bit further away, but still gives us an image of what to expect. So we'll click this one here. We can see it now says live. And now we can see what's happening out here, Eastern Kentucky toward Virginia. I hope you enjoyed this. I cannot wait to do more with you in the future on showing you exactly how everything works and the way that you can customize things. The best thing about WeatherWise is that you can make it your own. There are two QR codes on your screen and the link at the bottom to take you wherever you may need to access the WeatherWise radar.